All right, Go Big Orange Friday is here where I am joined, as I am at this time every single week, by Mr. Ethan Stone of the UTK Daily Beacon. Ethan, how are you, sir? I'm very good. School is really starting to pile up uh, right now, but it's okay. We're, we're soldiering on. I'm good. Yeah, uh, it is. Um, it is starting to get more stuff. Uh, it turns out school actually comes with assignments um, that I was just... Uh, I, I was led astray on uh, on that part of grad school for me. But yeah, no, I'm right there, I'm right there with you. But um, I don't know. The one thing to do is just think about like you still got what, three months? We've got time. We got because if you do the February to March, March to April, April to May, we still got some time. So it's not overwhelming for me yet where I'm like, oh, wow, I feel behind. And like, I can't let that uh, sink in just yet. So um, we, we got time. Let's just breathe. Baseball season hasn't even started. Has not even started. Um, Ryan Shumpert is also here of Rocky Top Insider. Ryan, how are you? Good. I mean, telling me baseball season hasn't even started is not a good thing because I am in Ethan's boat of overwhelm and I don't even have mm-hmm. to deal with too much baseball stuff yet. So it's only going to get worse here in the next few weeks. But doing well. Uh, hate to say it. Or, I don't know why I hate to say it. Love to say it. Called it on here last week when uh, we didn't do it. I said we'd be back discussing the Vols' nine-game SEC winning streak. I cannot do six plus two, apparently. It's only eight games. But the uh, the prediction was accurate, and that's all that matters. Absolutely. Uh, so the Vols, let's just start with Kentucky. So they beat Kentucky um, quite badly, quite handily on Tuesday. There were a lot of big takeaways. Um, Ryan, let's start with you. What was your what was your biggest takeaway from the Vols in the last few weeks, or in the last week, I should say, uh, with the Vanderbilt game, with uh, Kentucky, with the eight game sec win streak but specifically i mean kentucky like what uh what were your main takeaways yeah i think i mean there was a ton of takeaways to have in a game that tennessee played really well but i think my biggest one just goes hand in hand with why tennessee's playing so much better the last few weeks and it's it's guard plays sky ziegler has stepped up and is not just the energy burst off the bench who provides a you know really good offensive game every couple times out he's become a consistent offensive player and tennessee's backcourt completely flipped the script from the game in lexington a few or I guess a month ago, I think in that game, Severe Willer, Ty Ty Washington, and Kellen Grady combined for 48 points. They combined for 17 in Knoxville on Tuesday night. Tennessee's backcourt of Ziegler, Vescovy, and Chandler combined for 49 points. Those guys were spectacular, and Tennessee is going to go as far as that trio can take them, and the two freshmen continually just seem to be getting better and better and better, especially Ziegler. I think Chandler is doing the same too. And now that Vescovy doesn't have to be the go-to scorer, the number one guy, it just makes things easier for him because I don't think he's a number one option, but he's a really good number two option. And you've seen that he continues to just shoot the ball at an unbelievable rate. I think he, he's shooting at 46% from three point range in SEC play, which is just staggering. I mean, it, that's a number that doesn't feel sustainable, but we're two thirds of the way into the season and he, he's doing it or into the conference season further than that, the actual season. So there's really no reason to think he's slowing down in that trio. I think it's just going to be, they're really fun to watch. And I don't see any reason why that's going to change before the NCAA tournament. Yeah, for sure. I, I had Will on last night, uh, Mr. Stats by Will, and we were talking um, about what Tennessee can be. And he still like raises the possibility that number two seed's not out of the question for this Tennessee team as of yet. I mean, they got to win out. Um, they probably have to beat Kentucky in the SEC tournament again. Um, but they, it's still there. Like the They still kind of control their own destiny to getting to a number two seed, which is pretty remarkable considering where we were with this team just a few weeks ago. Um, Ethan, when you looked at this team and the rotation adjustments that uh, Barnes had to make because of Kuma's injury and him having to do a lot more of just one big lineup, um, just one big guy, I think that was something that stood out uh, to Will and myself um, on Tuesday, um, especially with Folky at that five spot by himself. Um, what have you seen as the biggest difference between uh, Tennessee basketball without Kuma and just uh, what uh, what you make of it? Well, I, I remember walking out with Ryan when we found out that, that Conwell was going to be out for the rest of the season. And I just straight up asked him, I was like, what do you think, you know, for the long term, what's what's going to happen? And he said, short term, he's probably going to do pretty well. And, and, you know, he's kind of shown that he's been right. I mean, I think something that's really jumped out to me is just how well Tennessee has moved the ball without, and not necessarily without Conwell, but with a four, like, small ball lineup. Because I think I was just looking at Tennessee's, like, one of the top ten teams in the nation for assists per field goals made like 63 percent of their shots come off assists 
And like Ryan was saying, that's just being able to have Viscovi, being able to have Zakai and Kennedy just kind of do what they do and, you know, not, not be worried about any sort of, any sort of like anything else for that. And I mean, it just kind of depends on how well the big plays in that as well. Like for example, against Kentucky, Fulkerson looked more intense than I've seen him at any point this season. I mean, mm. probably wasn't his best game just because Arizona, he was playing really well, but just like intensity from him. I, I hadn't seen that from him all season I mean, when he's going to rush to save the ball out of bounds to save the possession. Like he wasn't doing that a month ago. And, and like, I don't know if, if that's just a Kentucky thing, if that's just a Fulkerson coming back to life, I'm not sure. He's, he's probably going to revert back to old ways soon, but it was just really interesting to see how, intense he was against Kentucky and I think going back to the assist thing that that really just kind of shows how good the team can be on offense and I feel like that was kind of pushed in the closet earlier with two two bigs on the court at the same time early in the season he seems healthier as Ryan raises his hand down there yes Ryan (laughs) yeah well I was gonna say just kind of adding on that thought I think Fulkerson we've talked about on here he's in his most effective when he can play in space and he's not Mm -hmm. bogged down and the game doesn't become super physical and I think that that small ball lineup plays perfectly into that. There's just so much more space on the court, uh, so much more room for movement. And I think you've seen him play better in that lineup. You saw it in the South Carolina game. You saw it uh, against Vanderbilt. Kentucky was obviously the biggest factor of it. But I think it's just a much better system for for him to be in too, and sets him up for a lot more success. Yeah, and I I think we have to talk about the elephant in the room here, which is the difference between Brandon Huntley Hatfield and I do. And I think that is something that Barnes is probably going to have to have an uncomfortable conversation with um, the rest of the way here because it's just, it's not happening this year for BHH. It's just not happening. And now we're fighting for a two seed and we're fighting. And I do is good in this game. He was really good against Kentucky. I think he's probably, he probably should be Fulkerson's back. Like, it's just so interesting that Barnes has basically four guys now he has to figure out. They, the four cannot play together. But the four he could use with Plabs, with Folky, with I do, with Brandon Huntley Hatfield. Like he will try with BHH and Folky for a little bit and stuff like that, but that can't happen. Like that needs to be done. Like we need to only have one big out there, just at Jordan James, the four, the majority of these minutes. Um, we just see the offense. Like you said, it's so much more opened up. And then, I mean, the expert guard play, it, it part of that is because we're just going smaller and Barnes doesn't really have a choice but to go smaller. And I also just think, Kumal was doing so many things defensively, which were great, but um, you only can do the Kobe turnarounds down low so many times before you're like, okay, it's still just a a net negative on offense. And he was still someone that he needed the right kind of look uh, inside for him to really get anything going. And now you're replacing him with JJJ at the four, which can give you a lot more versatility and do a lot more stuff. It just seems like the floor is a lot more open. There's a lot more space the last few Tennessee games. And maybe that's just because Kuma should be a five, like a, a small ball five going into next year and doing that kind of stuff. But I don't know. I think it's it's pretty interesting. Sakai Ziegler is still just an animal um, and we cannot uh, we cannot uh, emphasize that enough of just how good and how much fun he is for Tennessee. And also Kennedy was cooking a little bit. Uh, Kennedy was getting into it and we see what this team can be when he is on, but I would still love a little bit more pick and roll action with Folky and uh, Kennedy Chandler. Like, I don't know why we don't do that at least nine times a game. It's kind of like the John Collins, Trey young thing where it's like, just keep doing that a couple times and then see if they can stop it in back-to-back possessions. And if they can, then you move off of it. But um, I, I would prefer a little bit more of that, but I mean, I don't know. It was it was kind of wild to see Tennessee just blow out Kentucky. I thought they were going to win, but I didn't think it would be to that extent. But Ryan, what do you think about I do and what you've seen? And do you think Hatfield should even be in the rotation going forward? That's a good question. I mean, I do what he did in that Kentucky game was a revelation. I mean, it. I was high on a do of helping this team the rest of the way mm-hmm. and playing a role. But even I was like... <laughs> <laughs> versus Oscar Sheboy. Yeah, that is a difference in arm size that you won't quite see anywhere else in the SEC this season. And he played fantastic. I mean, he offensively he kept the ball moving. He's not going to be a stud, but he did when he got the ball. He did what he was supposed to do with it. He went up strong when he got the ball and opportunities to score. And then defensively, he was just really, really strong. And even besides the three block shots, and just countless shots around the rim for Kentucky guards that he severely altered and made significantly harder to finish and. 
if he does that on a consistent basis, I would, you know, I would agree. Maybe you, you really cut Brandon Huntley Hatfield, maybe not even minutes back because he's not playing a ton of minutes anyway, but it's opportunities back. Now I'm not sure you're going to get that consistency from I do. And that's why uh, I'm still on this. I agree with the way Barnes is handling these four big men, because I just don't think you have a single one of them that you can trust every single t- mm-hmm. game out. So I like the idea of getting all four of them in the game in the first five, six minutes, figure, trying to figure out who's playing well, who's locked into the game. And look, we've seen countless times Brandon Huntley Hatfield will play the first four minutes and doesn't come back in, which is weird. I get that. He's a starter who's not playing a ton of minutes. But I think it's overall a good philosophy to try to ride the hot hand. Now, to that point, Huntley Hatfield really hasn't been the hot hand any time in the last six weeks. So you wonder if that's ever the case. But I think when you add the fact that, one, he's a freshman, one, he's incredibly talented, Tennessee doesn't want him to transfer you know, after this season. I think keeping him locked in mentally with the team – and look, if you have one injury, you have one foul trouble, there's a good chance you're going to need him to play serious minutes in, in a big game. So uh, while his production hasn't been there, and I, I understand the thought process of, of not playing him, I don't think Barnes is going to go fully to the small ball lineup 100% of the time. I think he's going to keep two bigs out there, uh, at least for some time in every single game. And I think having Hatfield locked in, checked in, understanding what's going on in practice every single day is going to be important because I think there's a chance you're going to need him. Yeah, I think that's a fair way of framing it. What do you What do you think, Ethan? Yeah, I'm I'm gonna second that, especially with emphasis on the on the foul trouble slash injury part of it. Um, you know, Huntley Hatfield, I feel like hasn't played that major of a role except for starting. Like Ryan said, he's only been playing the first couple minutes, and then it's kind of the hot hand after that. We can see that with Adu playing 18 minutes the other day, but like heaven forbid if I do start to play in 25 minutes a game and then, you know, shatters his wrist or something like that, we're going to need BHH to come in and, and, you know, just, just fill that void for the time being just so Barnes can figure out something else, you know, what, what else he's going to do. But like, especially with this team's like, I guess not knack, but like looking for a word, like ability for lack of a better word to foul more than you would think, especially like to where Barnes is going to, pull you automatically if you have two fouls in the first half like I guess that's a stylistic thing but when it comes down to it that's just kind of how Tennessee's offense runs that's how Tennessee basketball runs so only Hatfield is kind of gonna have to find a role no matter how how big or small it is but I mean just saying to take him out of the rotation I don't think Barnes will do that for the points that Ryan listed out and especially just because of the foul trouble just because of the rotation that they have just kind of inherently yeah um, well, what do we think about Arkansas uh, this weekend? Um, there's a lot going on, like Tennessee, Lady Vols, South Carolina. We've got Arkansas, Tennessee. We've got Tennessee baseball. Um, there's a lot on our plate, and it sounds like Ethan and Ryan will not be hitting the books all that hard this week, and they'll not be playing catch up. It sounds like. Um, uh, but what do y'all what do y'all think uh, in terms of what to expect out of this Arkansas matchup on Saturday? Well, we both have a paper due on Monday, so we're, <laughs> we're going to have to hit the books a little bit. Um, How long no, is it? I, mean, I, think it's, I think it would be a more impressive win for Tennessee to win at Arkansas than it was for them to beat Kentucky at home Tuesday. With b- being on the road being the biggest reason of that, the fact that you're coming off one of your biggest wins of the season being another reason there. Arkansas is playing really well. I don't think Tennessee's won in Bud Walton Arena in over a decade, one of the hardest places to play in the SEC. So – I do think it's a good matchup for Tennessee. Arkansas is likes to uh, run four guard lineups too. So I don't think you'll see Barnes try to force the, the two big lineup much, which I think he's just, he likes, he likes to play that lineup. He's tentative to go small. So I think when giving the opportunity to play uh, three guards, two bigs, he's going to do so. I think this game opens it up to really let Tennessee play its small ball lineup, which I think is good for it. But going on the road, Arkansas team is playing really well. Tennessee due for a loss and coming off of just a really emotional, massive win for a team. It's going to be a really, really challenging game. And one that I would just be not to say it's, you know, it's not winnable for Tennessee. I think it'll be close. I don't think Tennessee will get blown out by any means, but I, it would just be really, really impressive to me if they went on the road and won in Fayetteville. And let me tell you, if they do, it's going to be a dangerous game for me. Cause all of a sudden I'm going to start buying back in. I'm going to be the undertaker Jeff out of the coffin <laughs> thinking about Tennessee's SEC championship hopes. Because if they beat Arkansas, you're a win away from win, win over Auburn away from being praying that someone else beats Auburn, basically, which Auburn doesn't play a very hard schedule the rest of the way. I think Florida Saturday and then at Mississippi State 
uh, their two hardest games besides Tennessee left. But if Tennessee gets the job done on Saturday, I am going to be officially back on SEC championship watch, and that is a dangerous game for, for me to get into. Oh, wow. Ethan, are you that optimistic about this weekend? Yeah, at this point, and I, I know I'll kind of touch on what Ryan was saying. I, I understand that Tennessee plays Arkansas at Arkansas this week, but looking forward, you got Arkansas again, you got Auburn at home. And Tennessee has shown me nothing that says that they're going to lose at home the rest of the season. I don't know. Even if it is Auburn, and Auburn seems to have this thing about beating Tennessee. But anyway, getting back to Arkansas, they've won 10 of their last 11. Like, they're, they're not what they were at the beginning of the season. You know, they were kind of fumbling out of the gate to start there. But, no, they've got a good team down there. And, I mean, as they showed by beating Auburn just, just a few weeks ago, a few days ago, that arena can get electric when when they're cooking on all cylinders or firing on all, on all cylinders. So, And, I mean, it's just echoing what Ryan said at this point. It's going to be difficult to walk in there and win a game. It was difficult to walk into Mississippi State and win a game. And, and you know, Tennessee fans rejoiced at that. And that was an amazing win over Mississippi State. I didn't think they'd win that game, especially after losing Kamwa. But I guess mm-hmm. hindsight is uh, is twenty twenty when it comes to that. But, but no, when – when you're talking about just beating Mississippi State, just beating a team like Kentucky, I, I'd i be surprised if they won this game, I'm going to be totally honest. I think they'll split the series with Arkansas. I think they'll win at home, like I just said. I think they'll probably play around with Auburn. I'm not really sure. That's probably their toughest home game of the season so far. But, mm-hmm. but no, they, they've shown me nothing to say that they're going to lose at home the rest of the season. This might be the last game that Tennessee loses in a regular season. Yeah, I don't know. I I have no idea how this is going to go. I also don't like the time that it's on because it conflicts with my other Saturday plans and being at the baseball game. So uh, don't love that. Um, and then, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. But um, let's move forward to the bas- uh, for the football team, rather, and we'll wrap up with um, Tennessee baseball as they try. And I, I think one of us will be actually pitching one of the games this weekend i'm pretty sure it will be either ethan ryan or myself on the mound on sunday it looks like so whichever one of us is least interested in uh the daytona 500 in the afternoon will probably get the start it looks like um but that's just that's just where we're at right now um i want to talk about the tennessee depth chart at the receiver spot um on this edition of the podcast because i think it's interesting with (sighs) there's more uncertainty now with isaiah nair going to uh, Texas and spurning the ball to the last minute. Um, it's Jalen Hyatt, <laughs> that spot, it looks like, who it should have been there, but it's going to be Tillman. We know getting him back was huge. Um, Ryan and I's favorite player in Ramel Keaton, just hanging around. Just He's not going anywhere. The man's just going to be a great what if and just, hey, he's, he's around. This man's going to be a 19-year volunteer, it feels like. But Um, you look at it and you're like, man, I don't know. This is kind of more uncertain. Like it's a lot of let's believe in Jimmy Calloway and then a bunch of young guys, like maybe Walker Merrill picks up a a bigger part of this offense next year. I have my doubts. And then you're just like, all right, who amongst, uh, Cam Miller, Caleb Webb, Chaz Nimrod and Squirrel White is a hypo going to trust the most. Um, Jimmy holiday is probably out of uh, the equation at this point, but I don't know. Like, uh, Ethan, when you look at the wide receiver room, what uh, what do you make of it right now? And does it actually give you kind of some concern that it's kind of kind of thin with proven commodities? I'll be honest, it really doesn't concern me. I know that might be a little bit of a hot take, but at this time last year, or I guess you know before the season, mm-hmm. people people didn't know Tillman was gonna was gonna be the guy that he was. You know, there there were people saying that Tillman was like a three four option in, in this offense behind Jalen Hyatt, behind guys that people thought were going to break out. And, and then Tillman, you know, comes out of nowhere, and he's by far the best receiver on the team. I, I remember I saw a thing a couple days ago on Twitter, and I don't know if this was from ESPN or Bob from Kentucky, but it was saying that Tillman was like a top 10 returner in, in college football this season, which I think is fair. But, you know, if you've got Tillman and you've got a guy that can attract all the attention in, you know, in the routes, and then you've got a guy that's talented like Jalen Hyatt, maybe he's due for a breakout year. That's That's what Tennessee said last season, but – You've got guys like White, who I think is going to be really talented. I think Webb is going to get a lot of a lot of notice, I feel like, in his first season. And just with how much Heupel likes to throw the ball deep and likes to, you know, scheme plays to where you can get that big, long play, I'm, I'm not personally worried about the offense. I'm not worried about 
the receiving part of the offense because if you've got a guy like Hooker that if he can take this next step like people are saying he can, then I, I'm, I'm, I'm not really sure that the offense won't just fix itself. The receivers won't just fix itself in that regard. Ryan, are you that optimistic? Um, a little bit in the middle. I mean, I definitely think it's a question mark. I think you hit nail on the head. The depth is, is a question mark. You look at it and you don't know where everybody's going to be. But I do have some confidence that are going to figure it out. And to me, the big question is not just how productive Jalen Hyatt can be, but can Jalen Hyatt move to the outside? Because you look mm-hmm. at where Tennessee's returning receivers are. Nair was going to fill that uh, that outside spot that Javante Payton yeah. uh, left. And really, besides Tillman, most of Tennessee's production, at least the guys that I feel good about a receiver, are in the slot. I am put me on the, the captain of the Jimmy Callaway fan club. I think he's going to be a good player. I think he's really, really good with the ball in his hands uh, receiver. I think Bayless was the only one on last year's team that was better than him. And I think he's just perfectly fit for the slot. So I think you need Jalen to Hyatt to have some progression to be able to move to the outside, be a productive receiver. And look, Javante Payton was not a stud by any means, but he was a guy that was capable of having big plays, uh, seemingly about one a game, it, it seemed like, and they were always going to be a touchdown. And that's kind of the game Hyatt has too, is a big play receiver. So I think Tennessee – While there are question marks, I think that's the big thing that you look at is where does Hyatt end up? Because I think him being able to be versatile, play different spots is going to be huge for Tennessee and huge for Tennessee's depth. Because on that outside, besides Tillman, it's really kind of Ramel Keaton and the freshman. And like you said, I think it's uh, one of those freshmen, if not multiple, are going to have to step up and play some. Squirrel White is the guy that I have the most confidence in. He seems to be, again, a natural slot. So I think in a slot, they have a ton of depth. And obviously Tillman is going to be a stud on the outside. It's that second outside spot spot that gives me concern and and kind of pause right now. Yeah. I mean, Peyton came in late, so maybe they do get somebody else late. Maybe this is something where after spring practice, someone on the outside, somewhere else in the SEC or somewhere, I mean, even just outside the SEC is unhappy about their role. I mean, we just saw Jaden Daniels enter the portal um, randomly. So I don't know. The portal is the wild, wild west. So, like, I don't think it's set in stone that just because we didn't get Nair that we're not going to get someone else if Hypo looks at spring practice and he's like, there's not enough. I I, I need to dip back in because this is not going to work. We we need some more veteran depth. Um, I need my Javante Payton. Uh, like, I, I can't lose Payton and Jones. Like, if we had lost Tillman, I don't know. I think we look at this wide receiver room pretty, pretty terrifyingly. But again, if we lose Tillman, he's probably more aggressive in the portal. He's probably more aggressive after some of the other names, even above Nair. Like, I... I don't know. It's hard to forecast what we would have done if he had declared. But I mean, losing him, Peyton and um, Vilas all in the same same class would be pretty, pretty brutal. Uh, but that being said, offense is never going to be something I worry about with Hypo. Like I'm not going to be all that concerned. Um, and even with receivers, I'm still more concerned about the depth at running back. I'm still more concerned about how much is going to be asked of Javari Small then uh, who's going to be behind Tillman on the outside depth chart. Like, I, I don't know. Uh, we'll see. We'll see on that front. But getting into the Tennessee baseball weekend, Georgia Southern on the docket this weekend. Tennessee baseball is back. Excited for all of this. Um, I, uh, I'm a little concerned, though. Like, I made a joke about the starting pitching depth because everyone's going down. Uh, we get a Vandy transfer. Uh, that's kind of weird, the waiver going on there. I Look, NCAA, let's talk. So Kumar Rocker is hanging out. He's chilling. There's no reason that this man could not be a Tennessee volunteer for this season. Stay hot. Get ready for next year. Um, I think it would just be a, a nice thing. And what does the University of Tennessee like doing more than anything else? They like doing nice things for other people, especially talented people like the three people on this podcast. So do the right thing and ensure that Kumar Rocker uh, fulfills my fantasy of being a Tennessee volunteer after dominating as a Vanderbilt Commodore for years. Um, what do we think of this weekend, Ryan? How do you how do you see the the arms that are going to ostensibly be on the mound? And uh, what do you what are you looking for out of the balls this weekend? Chase Burns, the only official starter, he'll get the ball <laughs> Friday afternoon. And Dolan, Chase Dolander is going to start too. Well, what game will be the question mark there? And I think that third game is just going to be kind of an – someone's going to get an opener, try to throw the first three, four innings, and then Tennessee's going to hand it over to their bullpen because, like you said, they're just kind of out of, of arms, of starting arms that they can use. And with that, with a solid Georgia Southern team here, I think it's going to be a competitive weekend. Tennessee 
beat them, uh, swept them in Statesboro, right? That's where Georgia Southern is, Statesboro. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, last last year in a very competitive series, they swept them, but two of those three games were really close. The Sunday game went into 13 innings. So I would be surprised and really impressed if Tennessee got a sweep this weekend with a sweep this weekend with all uh, the pitching injuries they have, but certainly still one I think they should take care of and win the series. And really, to me, I'll be curious. Watch the infielders, how they perform, all those guys, and I'll be interested even more than that just to see starting lineup Friday, Saturday, Sunday. How much does that change? How many different guys are in the lineup as, as Tennessee kind of tries to figure some things out there? Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, I'm i excited. Thankfully, it's just Georgia Southern, so we don't really have to hit the panic button yet. I'm um, excited to see if their uniforms is, are as atrocious as they were last year because those were, I think, the worst uniforms we saw in baseball. Abomination. Uh, an abomination. Um, so let's hope that that's not the case. Um, Ethan, what are, you, what are you looking for out of the Vols baseball team this weekend? And I'll tell you what I'm looking forward to is learning about the Tennessee baseball program. <laughs> I, I specifically asked our editors, I said, hey, I've got a lot of school stuff. I've got wedding to plan for. I've got all sorts of stuff. Let's have one of our guys that's going to be the editor next year cover baseball this season. And I didn't do that because of that. I did that because I know nothing about the Tennessee baseball program. What I do know is, like you guys have said, pitching is is a problem. I, I think I saw that Chase – Burns is going to be getting the start, I think, Friday. I'm not 100% sure. I saw that, you know, obviously Ethan Smith got um, got his waiver um, accepted or, or whatever. Mm-hmm. He's going to be, you know, eligible to play this season. So, obviously, that's that's big for especially this opening weekend with, with um, you know, a couple arms out already. But I'm just going to be interested to see what, what the outfield can do, I guess. Can Drew Gilbert, can the guys that are returning take a next step and actually, you know, up their production from last year from – from even what we saw in that run to Omaha last year. And, and yeah, just see if the bats can get going, really, because I feel like pitching eventually is going to solve itself kind of as the season moves along. But that question has always been, hey, can we get enough returning production to where we can actually, you know, put runs on the board? Yeah, for sure, for sure. How do you see it uh, going this weekend, Ryan? Give me, do you think they win, they sweep two or three? What, uh, what do you think ends up happening? I'll say two out of three. I'll okay. take the series, but don't get the sweep. Ethan, what about you? Yeah, I'll say the same. Two out of three seems good. I mean, like Ryan said, it's hard to sweep just about anybody, especially opening weekend when you're still trying to find a line, find lineups and stuff like that. Won't allow it. Sweep or bust. Not uh, not here for anything other than a sweep. Um, unfortunately, I've ran the numbers, and that's right, folks. Tennessee should sweep. Um, that's what the numbers are saying. That's what they're that's what saying. That's what the analytics say. Mm-hmm. Be careful what you ask for. What if it's the other way around? Then, then you look like a fool. I mean, if it's the other way around, if we get swept what by if? Georgia Southern, what if? What if? That's 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 all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's gonna happen. Ethan, what are you doing? Like, what uh, what are Never we doing? Never deal here? in absolutes. Never deal in absolutes when making predictions. <laughs> Is that a Star Wars reference? Is that what you're doing? Yes. Like the only the yes, Sith deal in absolutes? Is that what's that happening? That wasn't here? what I was trying to do, but but okay. it, it works. It works. <laughs> Unbelievable. Unbelievable. Um, Ethan, what can the good folks check out from you and the rest of the team over there at the UTK Daily Beacon? Yeah, so we just finished up our spring sports preview. A lot of good work on that. Um, if you're on campus, you can find one on campus. Uh, otherwise, you can go to utkdailybeacon.com, take a look at that, and then we'll have full coverage of baseball this um, this weekend and then followed by Tennessee, Arkansas, Tennessee, South Carolina, Lady, Lady Balls basketball, and, you know, all that. Too much going on, man. Too, Too much, much going, going on. on. Too much going on. Ryan, what about you and the good folks over there at Rocky Top Insider? Yeah, three baseball previews over the past week and a half. A lot on the pitching, a lot on the batting, and then uh, some predictions today if you guys want to get into the, the good stuff, um, all that. And then plenty of stuff on the Tennessee basketball team who, who keeps on rolling, and we'll have everything you need from Fayetteville this weekend. There you go. There you go. Um, Ryan, Ethan, thank you so much for the time, per usual. And uh, I'll probably see you around uh, campus this weekend. I'm going to guess that if y'all are around campus, I'll, I'll see you around this weekend. Uh, but always a pleasure, and I will talk to you guys very soon. Sounds great. Thanks.